So first, a disclaimer. This is not safe for work for a reason. It has some language and some events that are a bit, uh, well, let's just say this isn't a story I would tell in church. Also, as this involves hitchhiking, I realize that someone out there will surely say, well, hitchhiking is dangerous. I am fully aware of this, as you will soon find out. So now that's out of the way, on to the story. It was around 2004, I decided I'd had enough of the bitter, cold, rocky mountain winters. I'd spent most of my time since I was around 16, listening almost exclusively to Jimmy Buffett music, except for small breaks to listen to things like Journey's Greatest Hits. He was pretty much my entire musical life. I would listen to him talk about these far-off places and these great adventures and weird characters that he'd come across. I read his books, which talked about pretty much the same thing. I read interviews where, you guessed it, he talked about pretty much the same thing. So my young, 22-year-old brain was filled with these ideas that adventure was out there waiting for me that all I had to do was go and find it. Why was I rotting away in a frozen hell when there was so much more to see in the more tropical climates? And it is this thinking that led me to pack everything I owned and stick my thumb out on the interstate. I was headed for Mobile, Alabama, which is Jimmy's hometown. Then I was headed for Florida, where most of his songs are based. Then, well, the possibilities seemed endless. Maybe find some work on a boat in exchange for passage to some place like Jamaica. You can go ahead and laugh at me. It's been around 17 years, so wisdom and life experience has allowed me to see clearly how stupid I was for all of this. I can take the ribbing. I've been getting grief over it for the better part of two decades. More on that later. My journey took me through Texas and Arkansas. There are many funny stories along this journey. Like the time I was picked up in a desert by an old guy named Buddy in a hippie van. However, these stories are not the focus here, because they aren't creepy. Along the way, I also passed through Falk, Arkansas, and learned about the Falk monster. Fascinating little bit of folklore. So anyway, my journey took me down to South Louisiana, and Interstate 10. When you head down the section of highway between Lafayette and Baton Rouge, you have to pass over a Chafalaya Basin, which means crossing over 18 miles of swampland via bridge. According to Wikipedia, this bridge is the third longest in the US, second longest in the United States interstate system, and 14th longest in the world. That's a lot of bridge, and the shoulder, virtually non-existent. From what I've been told, police are quick enough to nab anyone foolish enough to try crossing this bridge on foot, so I was stuck for hours, on the Lafayette side of the bridge, attempting to thumb a ride across. Eventually, I was successful, and this is where things take an unsettling turn. A white van pulled up. When the door opens, there was no one in the vehicle but an old man. He looked to be in his late 60s or early 70s, quite obese, and wearing nothing but a pair of shorts. I climbed in and thanked him for stopping. As we took off, when the Sun Goes Down by Kenny Chesney and Uncle Cracker was playing on the radio. Due to the events that followed, I have forever lost any liking I had for that song. We were headed across this massive bridge with nowhere to stop and nowhere for me to go. The man started looking at me like a dog might look at a particularly meaty bone. It was making me uneasy already. Hey boy. He said in a thick Cajun accent. How big are you packing? Excuse me? I asked. I looked back at him, then out the window of the moving vehicle. There was no escape route. I bet it's pretty big, he said, smiling at me. I really don't want to discuss this, I said. Nothing but guardrail on the right and swampland below that. Jumping out would be deadly. He proceeds to question me and ask to see it. No, I don't think so, I replied. What I was thinking was, you can wish in one hand and shit in the other, and see which one fills up first. Undeterred, the man went on. 
I'd sure like to take you into the swamp. Oh, hell. If I once thought that this situation couldn't get any worse, I would have been so, so incredibly mistaken. No, I don't think so, I repeated. Oh, come on, boy, he insisted. It'll only take us about 30 minutes. Please understand that I'm making his English clearer for those reading, but it was thick Cajun, as I've said before. The way he was saying it made it way creepier. At this point, the man had asked me to expose myself and expressed his desire to take me into the swamps. I couldn't help but wonder if he was going to give me a choice or if he was just going to take me there by force. If he did, I would be virtually helpless. I wasn't from there. I didn't know the area. I certainly didn't know the layout of the swamps. I would have been at his mercy, and whatever it was that was pleased took a lot of forms in my mind. Would he take me somewhere, do whatever he wanted with me, and then feed me to the gators? Would he hold me prisoner and torture me before killing me and feeding me to the gators? Or would he just kill me immediately and feed me to the gators? For some reason, Every scenario involved alligators. I don't want to go into the swamp with you, no, I said as firmly as my overwhelming fear would allow. As I'm here telling this today, it goes without saying that I did not end up as gator bait. He didn't take me forcefully into the swamps. He didn't do anything to me physically. Psychologically, however, his terrifying comments were torture as the bridge went on and on and on. For what seemed like forever. When we finally reached the other side and he let me out, I thanked him for the ride as politely as I could manage. When he pulled away, I could have fallen down and kissed the ground. I was safe. I was not dead. My journey continued for several days until I ultimately ended up in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. There was another incident before I got there when I was picked up in Walker, Louisiana by a man who wasn't so much creepy as he was potentially dangerous. By the time I ran into him, I was physically exhausted and dirty, and I hadn't had decent rest in days. When he and his wife offered to let me stay in their guest room for the night, I was so grateful to not have to sleep in the woods or in a ditch along the side of the road, or in the back booth of some diner, that I took them up on it. Desperation and exhaustion will cloud a person's thinking. As we pulled away, he said, in a genuinely friendly tone, that I was welcome at his home and that he wasn't dangerous. I genuinely believed him until he pulled out a gun from between the seats and warned me that I better not be dangerous either. Oh boy. So why did I still go with him? Exhaustion and desperation, like I said. So, I'm in the guest room of his trailer, in a comfortable bed for the first time, and I'm pretty sure it was a couple of weeks. I'm relaxing there when his sister comes over. I don't see them being in a bedroom, but I hear them in the living room. She's suicidal and wanting to die. That's all she keeps talking about. Wanting to die and wanting to end it all. Finally, I hear the man get fed up and snap. You want to die, he screams. You want to die. And then I hear a gunshot. Oh my god. There are several seconds there where I'm again terrified of what's about to happen to me. This man just shot his sister, and I'm here in the house with him, a potential witness. I look up at the window, wondering if I can fit through it and escape. I cannot. Then I hear her speak up. You shot a hole in the ceiling. So apparently, he hadn't shot his sister. He was just a trigger-happy lunatic who had shot around into the ceiling to emphasize his frustration. To be fair, they were actually very nice people. After the commotion, I ended up staying overnight anyway. His wife took me back to the interstate in the morning. We had a nice conversation along the way, but I wouldn't stay there again. Ever. It's a one-star rating, but my hosts were very polite. When I got to Bay St. Louis, I ended up getting picked up by a lady who lived in Mobile, Alabama, who ended up taking me in, and she's my foster mother to this day. 
I love her to death. This horrific trip ended with me finding a new life and a new family, so there is a silver lining to every dark cloud, I suppose. Her husband, who is my foster father, has never stopped giving me grief about any of this. In almost 20 years, he's never tired of it. He especially liked to rip on Jimmy Buffett, an artist he despises, and he refers to him as Jimmy Buttplug. Did I learn anything from this? Well, if you're asking if I learned not to hitchhike, no. I went on several more journeys over the years before I'd finally decided that I'd had enough adventure. Someone will surely think I'm stupid for this. Young people tend to be stupid, so no argument there. If you need any further proof of this, watch MTV's coverage of Spring Break sometime. Watch how dumb those young people act as they party on the beach. As a word of advice to those who might be considering hitchhiking, just don't. You can meet a lot of really interesting people. You can have a lot of positive experiences, but you can also end up getting picked up by a maniac, and you might not be as lucky as I was. I was on a hitchhiking adventure from British Columbia, Canada to Antigua, Guatemala, which started in September 2019. If you've ever hitchhiked before, you know how amazing it is and how many cool people you can meet. Out of the thousands of rides across 40 countries, I've only had two bad or dangerous encounters thumbing it. This was my second one. I was taking a break from traveling to find weed trim work in California's Nevada City, a beautiful little town with a very interesting crowd, but I got stuck a few towns over for not getting a ride all day. I ended up sleeping at night at the Love's gas station, which I'd done plenty of times before. In the morning, I was a little more desperate to accept rides because no one was stopping and it had already been a whole day. I just wanted to get out of there. A pickup truck is speeding past me and slams the brakes ahead, then slowly backs up. Inside is a man and a woman in their late fifties, and he says in a husky voice, Where you headed, boy? Nevada City, any distance helps. We'll get in. We're going to Yuba. They seemed normal enough, even without most of their teeth and hair, so I jumped in. It all happened in rapid succession. I toss my bag in the back and jump in. I shut the door. I notice a pile of guns and bullets on the floor. And before I have time to rethink my decision, we speed off. So as I'm trying to assess whether or not I'm in danger, they start telling me how this guy just got out of jail for aggravated assault. How he beat that motherfucker so bad he can't think straight no more. And they both laugh. She's holding his seatbelt over his chest, and they both smell like shit. They start asking how much money I have. I start thinking to myself, yeah, I'm not safe here. After hitchhiking all this way, I don't look particularly wealthy. I'm filthy. I need a shower. I look no different than the stereotypical homeless guy, so I try to seem more poor than I am, and more tough than I am, too. I'm broke as fuck, man. That's why I'm going to the city. I'm hoping to make some cash trimming. The man looks me in the eye. Well, you'll find it alright. You'll find it good. Don't be afraid to do no dirty work. If people try, and they'll try, to fuck you, you fuck them first. You get what I'm saying? Put your eyes on the damn road. Jesus Christ. The woman points forward and he swerves back to the right lane. He asks me if I smoke. And knowing that California has legalized weed, I put two and two together. He's offering me a joint, so I say, Yeah, I smoke. With a wild look in his eyes, he exclaims, Great, and we turn off the highway and start down a dirt road. I'm more than worried, and I look behind us. In the back of the truck is my bag, a chainsaw, pickaxe, and a plastic tarp over something. That didn't help my anxiety. Finally, we stop in front of a clearing. The woman takes out, not a joint, 
but a meth pie. It's the first time I've seen a meth pie, and a lot of things start to make sense. While he lights up and exhales into the car, I roll the windows down as fast as possible because I don't want to smoke that shit. The woman takes some as well, and they tell me how they were going to collect money that a woman owes them. That damn bitch is going to pay today, one way or another. Damn straight, she better have the money. I'm going to grab her and say, where's my money, bitch? Oh, she'll have it all right. She'll have it or else. Say, son. You ever steal something? Because we could make $20,000 today. I don't know exactly how to answer this guy. And he repeats, $20,000 today. Here, smoke some of this. And he hands me the pipe. Nothing like meth. Ain't that right? I gently reject it and say that meth's not really my thing. Which he surprisingly takes well and smokes some more before putting it away and driving off back towards the highway. His driving is terrible. Swerving, speeding, hitting the brakes abruptly, and starts trying to convince me to help them steal marijuana plants. You'll hold my gun, and I'll drill the hole, and I'll keep a lookout. Yeah, baby girl will keep a look. Now you gotta be careful if you hear the dogs, because them sons of bitches are nasty. See this bite? and he reveals what looks like a terrible scar on his arm. I don't really know how to get out of the situation, so I sounded as confident as possible and said that I was meeting a friend to look for work together, and that they would be expecting me today. We neared the end of Yuba City when they pulled over the side. Well, it's your funeral. You don't want to eat, fine by me. But if you ever want the cash, you can call me. He then hands me his number. Hell no, I think. Thanks, I will. I quickly retrieve my bag, smiling nervously. The woman says with a wave, Take care now. God bless. And they speed off. I'm standing on the side of the road thinking, What the hell was that? I was just happy to be out of that car. At the age of 18 to 19, I used to pick up hitchhikers and go hitchhiking myself. The 1990s felt a bit different to now. One day I was traveling from Edinburgh to back home. It was about 70 miles. I saw a fella hitchhiking a ride just outside of Edinburgh city limits with a sign saying north. He seemed to have loads of stuff. Most went in a trunk, some in the back seat. He jumped in the front and off we went. He seemed quite awkward and his accent was all over the place. German, French, English. It felt forced though. Small talk was difficult. He looked punk or alternative. And so we will have music in common. Let's talk about music, I thought. He was wearing an exploited t-shirt, which is a local band. I asked if he saw them while in Edinburgh as they played two days before. He said he hadn't heard of them. Okay, I thought. The more we talked, the more uneasy I felt, and the more he seemed to relax. He had a bunch of piercings which he started talking about, and said he'd done them himself. They looked it. Each one was squint and looked brand new. He started telling me about how he'd been spending the last year or so, which sounded somewhat off-grid in terms of living. He'd been traveling around Europe on a motorcycle he'd built himself. Fair enough. I worked as a mechanic at that point in life, so I asked about the setup. He got irritated and changed the conversation. He then got onto how a monk had found him half dead in a field and nursed him back to hell. He then worked at the monastery to repay his debt. It sounded like something out of a movie. This bizarre story lasted 30 or so minutes. Through the monastery story, he kept saying there's no need to pull that face and getting quite aggressive. I mentioned it doesn't really make sense as you've jumped around four countries and I'm also driving and trying to listen to a German accent. He then freaks out and starts smashing his fists on the dashboard, screaming how he wants out. Fair play, we are almost there. As soon as I slowed down to a give way sign, he jumps out of the car 
flings the doors open, grabs his stuff, and walks off, leaving the doors open. I get out to close the doors and say sorry to the people behind me who had to wait and witness this. I look over to see where he's going, and he was climbing a fence and heading into a farmer's field. I was a little freaked out and just wanted to get home. The minute I'm through the door, my mom knows there's something wrong, and I tell her the story. She suggests I check the car in case he stole anything and phone the police. Yeah, he forgot some bags. Great. I phoned the police and left details. I forgot about it for a couple of days or so, and then I wake up to my car window smashed and the bags gone. It was a hard sinking moment. I phoned the police again, and this time they turned up and take a statement. I dropped him about 12 miles from where my parents lived, so I wrote it off as a coincidence. Six months later, I see a Crime Watch episode where they have the Have you seen this person section. Guess who it was looking like a suit. Wanted to cross Europe for very bad things. Entered the UK under false documents. Thought to have changed his appearance and attack people in a car after they picked him up hitchhiking. That was the second heart-sinking moment. Apparently, the punk rock look was a disguise. I've never picked up a hitchhiker since. Our car wasn't even turned off before the man started knocking on the driver's side window. My boyfriend and I were visiting our home state after a year away and decided to grab some drinks downtown. We just pulled into the parking lot of a bar when this man approached us with a white rag tied around his wrist. He began gesticulating wildly and attempting to talk to us through the window. My boyfriend cracked the window to speak to him. I just got stabbed trying to break up a knife fight, he said, pointing at a rag tied around his arm. Can you give me a ride to get some supplies? Obviously, alarm bells start immediately going off in my head. I internally call bullshit on this guy, being an innocent bystander to a knife fight, but I offered to call him an ambulance. I don't want no ambulance. That'll just cause trouble. I just need something to clean it, he replied. More alarm bells, but I do understand that some people fear the police. So, against our better judgment, my boyfriend and I offered to take him inside the bar and buy him a shot to pour on his wound, but he refused, insisting that going into the bar would just cause trouble, and that all he needed was a ride to get supplies. In a final attempt to sway us, he offered to show us his stab wound. He lifted the rag, a clean, pristine white rag, to show us what genuinely looked like a deep cut on his arm, a cut without any blood, anywhere, whatsoever, not even on the white rag. The cut was clearly Halloween makeup. We immediately rolled up the windows and drove away. My boyfriend said that as we were driving off, he saw a second man walk out from behind the bar and stroll down the street with the guy who'd been insisting on a ride. I truly believe that had we let him into our car, we would have either immediately been robbed or instructed to drive somewhere where we would have been robbed. We did call the police to report a suspicious person, but I never found out if anything came of our report. So, sketchy guy who faked being stabbed to try to get into my car, let's never meet again. Myself and my buddy Todd are driving through a town we live in. It's in Iowa. It was 12 or so at night and we were smoking lots of weed. He's only 15 and I'm 19 at this point. The reason he was driving is because I'm quadriplegic and I can't drive myself. The subwoofer I installed was pounding. In fact, we were so tuned into the music that we didn't notice that the street lights are suddenly not working where we're driving. My buddy looks back at me and asks for a song. I look up to ask what he's saying, just in time to see a man lit up like a deer in headlights. 
He wasn't normal. He had on khakis and looked like a presentable older man with blonde hair. Here's the creepy part. His thumb was straight out to his side like he was hitchhiking, and he had an ungodly grin that shouldn't be possible. We swerved all the way from the right lane across to the middle lane, then into the left in a matter of seconds, and we somehow managed to not scratch my vehicle. We both look back and I tell Todd to get us gone. We never saw anything on the news, and I even alerted the police. The creepiest thing was, he looked like an aged version of a mutual friend between us. This was only a few months ago, but I swear I still see things sometimes. Okay. So let me take you back to a weird encounter I had with this hitchhiker. It was midwinter last year. My brother and I were going to our grandparents' house. The route we took was pretty scenic, and it isn't a usual road people take to go where we're going, since there's easier and faster ways. As we drove past a certain road, there was this guy wearing really busted-looking flannel, jeans, shoes, and a cap. At first we just thought he was going to get picked up by someone, since hitchhikers aren't a big thing from where I'm from. Anyway, my brother looks at me and says, You reckon we should help him? Me, being the crime junkie I am, shook my head and said, Nah, he's probably waiting for someone specific. We arrived to my grandparents and have a good time there. The time we left was probably around 10pm and it was pretty dark already. My brother took the same way back as we just liked the views and longer drives. He was trying to be funny and drive really fast. As he did, we literally zoomed past the same man. I told him to go back since it's been like 3 or 4 hours since we last saw him. My brother hesitated at first, but then did a U-turn. When we got back to the guy, we asked if he wanted a ride and he says yeah. He told us where he wanted to go and we said sure. Why not? We're gonna go past there anyway. When he got into the back seat, the first thing we noticed was the smell. He reeked. Then, when I offered him a water bottle, he took it. He didn't look homeless or anything, so I didn't suspect that he was. But I did notice he had a hell of a lot of scratches on his arms. I brushed it off and just kept looking at the road. The drive was silent. When we arrived where he said to go, he hopped out of the car. My brother decided to wait until he went into the house. When we waited, the guy looked back and just stood there. I got a bit uneasy and told my brother to just drive off. He ended up doing so, but I feel so guilty that maybe something bad had happened and it was our fault. So for the next three weeks, I kept checking for any news around that area, but nothing popped up. I even asked officers to do a wellness check there, but they couldn't, as I didn't actually know anyone there personally. So yeah, that was my little experience with a weird hitchhiker. When I was a kid, my parents were impossibly strict. I was never given much opportunity to do things with my friends because my mother was confident that I'd end up doing drugs or having sex and whatever else her imagination could conjure up. The exception were a few Asian friends. My mother, a Thai woman, was inherently trusting of girls who were fully Asian and was less strict about my spending time with them. And so it happened that one day, Lin, a Chinese girl with two Chinese parents, invited me to the mall and my mother actually said yes. She even gave me 20 bucks for the bus, lunch, and maybe even a little something nice. Unfortunately, when I got to Lynn's house, she sadly announced that some family had showed up unexpectedly and she wouldn't be able to go. To describe my disappointment would be impossible. I was 14 and this was supposed to be the first real, without my parents outing, I've ever embarked on. And here was Lynn, telling me it wasn't going to happen. As she went back inside, I walked away, 
trudging back towards my house. But as I walked, the idea hit me. Why not just go myself? I had the money. I could just get on the bus by myself and go to the mall. It started off staggeringly successful. I managed to catch the right bus, got to the mall and wandered around. I had my first real burrito experience, played games in the arcade, and bought leather goddesses of Phobos. I was having the time of my life. It was getting dark, so I decided it was time to head back home. I got on the bus, paid my fare, and told the driver where I was headed. The driver shook his head and informed me that he didn't go that far. What's more, I'd caught the last bus leaving the mall for the day, and that by the time he got me to the transfer station to catch the right bus, the buses would be done running. I put on a brave face and asked him how close he could get me, he described a spot about two miles from my house, so I agreed that it was fine. He dropped me off where we discussed, which happened to be outside at Dunkin' Donuts. Being that it was February, and that I was woefully underdressed for any significant amount of time outside, I went inside and bought myself a hot cocoa. Armed with my cocoa, I started the trek home. About a quarter mile into the walk, I approached an area that had always given me a little pause. It was just beyond the railroad tracks. In fact, it was the area my mind always conjured up when someone used the phrase, the wrong side of the tracks. There was even a strip club on the corner and a few rundown houses. I was determined to be brave though and continued on resolutely. Just as I crossed the tracks, an oncoming red Econoline van slowed to a stop and the driver rolled down his window. He gave me a friendly smile and said, Hey, sweetheart, need a ride? Now, I may have been a dumb 14-year-old who hadn't had enough sense to realize that going to the mall alone in the first place was a bad idea, but I knew, with every fiber of my being, that taking a ride from strangers, and this particular stranger especially, was a very bad idea. I tried to smile casually and wait vaguely at a house nearby, Nah, I said. I just live over there. He looked back at the direction I was indicating, looked at me, and shrugged. All right, he said, but it's awfully cold out here. I just laughed and waved goodbye. He pulled away and drove off. Moments later, though, he drove by again, having apparently pulled a U-turn somewhere behind me. Just seeing this fan again made my heart skip a beat but he drove past me without slowing or even looking at me. He turned the corner ahead and I breathed a sigh of relief. As I rounded the corner though, my heart dropped. He was parked in the strip club's parking lot, with his van pulled in backwards so that it faced the street, his parking lights on. I couldn't see through the windshield, but I tried to act like I hadn't even noticed him. I tried to act casual. I was already rounding the corner, but once I saw him, I tried to inconspicuously change routes and try to act like I was headed for the house across the street. I calmly walked around the back of the house as if I maybe lived in the back and I just stood there trying to listen for signs of him driving away. I was terrified, however, when I saw headlights lighting up the driveway that you see running alongside the house. And sure enough, he drove his van slowly into view. I was frozen in fear. He reached the end of the driveway and turned around, slowly heading up. I could see him looking in my direction, but I couldn't tell if he'd actually seen me or not. As soon as he started up the driveway again, I forced my legs into motion, ran around the other side of the house and fled onto the porch and hid. I hid for what seemed like hours. I prayed someone would open the door and find me but I was too afraid to actually knock on the door and ask for help. Eventually, half frozen and scared, and knowing that it was starting to get late and my mother was going to start wondering where I was, I peeked over the railing and scanned for any sign of him. I didn't see any, so I started running home. I still had over a mile and a half to go before I got home, and even at 14, I couldn't sustain a run very long especially in my half-frozen condition. The walk seemed to take forever, and at every sign of a vehicle larger than a car, 
I would duck behind a tree or hide behind a bush. The entire time, I was mapping gateway routes. If he catches me up to here, where would I go? I can honestly say I've never been so terrified in my life. Less than a mile from home, I saw a large vehicle headed towards me that seemed to have the same headlights as an Econoline van. My heart just plummeted and I dove behind a bush. That I didn't piss myself when the driver slowed down is a wonder. I heard the window go down and amazingly, blissfully, I heard my mother's voice say, Julie? I stood up and there she was, in our Ford Bronco, peering at me in confusion. I think I went from behind the bush to inside the car in a single bound. I can say that I caught some serious hell that night for lying, being stupid and everything, but hell never felt so good, because the entire time I could only think about what might have happened. This happened in my early 20s. It still makes my skin crawl to think of what might have happened to me. Around 10.30 on a summer evening, I was driving home from my boyfriend's house and stopped to grab something to eat from a fast food joint. I also ordered a hamburger patty for my dog, who was in the back seat of my car. The street I need to turn left on to go home is pretty busy, and there's no stoplight. While waiting, I'm eating some of my food with my window half down, enjoying the nice weather. Then I hear someone say something to my left, and I see a group of four guys about a block away, walking in my direction down the sidewalk. Since my radio was on, I didn't hear what they said, and I stupidly turned it down and said, What? One of the guys in front says something, but again, I miss what he's saying. I glance back at the street and see a wall of traffic both ways, unable to turn and consider turning right instead so I can just leave. The guy speaks again, and this time, I heard him. Hey, can we get a ride? Oh, no, I stammered out. This isn't good. They're about ten feet away from my car at this point, and I start rolling up my window while glancing between the guys in traffic. There's still no openings. My window almost up, maybe a couple of inches left and I decided to back up into the parking lot and leave via an exit that led through a neighborhood. I put my car into reverse right as the guy who asked for a ride gets to my door. He sides up to the door, leans heavily against it, and asks again if he and his friends can get a ride. The way he was asking wasn't right, and his friends walked up pretty close by behind him. The next bit happened so fast, but felt like minutes went by. I took my foot off the brake to start reversing back into the parking lot because my brain was screaming at me to leave immediately. Rightly so, because as I say no and start to roll backwards, he tries to open my car door. I can still remember the thud sound of the handle snapping back down. Suddenly, my dog, who'd previously been enjoying his hamburger and oblivious to what was happening, jumped up and started throwing himself on the window and bouncing off of it, barking and snarling. The guy at my door puts his hands up and said, Oh, I didn't know you had a dog, as he and his friends quickly backed away. I floored it backwards with my heart in my throat. I didn't know my way through the neighborhood exit well, but I just kept driving and turning down streets until I figured out where I was. Once I got home, and was safely in my garage with the door shut, I realized how much I was shaking. I have no idea what those guys wanted to do, but I'm very glad I did not find out. I'm so thankful my dog lost his shit and provided enough of a surprise and distraction for me to get out of there. I'm also thankful to my mom for teaching me to always keep my car doors locked. This is probably one of the things I look back on and want to bang my head and shout at myself for. So, about five or six years ago, I gave someone a ride. 
It was late, like really late, perhaps 2 or 3 a.m. I had just finished my gym workout. At that time, I really liked going to the gym when it was dead, so I could use the machines I needed to without waiting. I was walking back to my car when a guy approached me. He looked normal. He explained that his car broke down and he was waiting on a tow truck. He asked me if I could give him a ride to the gas station that was about three miles away. I said yes. So, I unlock my car and motion him in. He directs me where to go. I make conversation while I'm driving, but get what I think at the time is mildly bizarre responses back. He makes a point to say his name several times. Admittedly, I've never been good with remembering names even in passing, and I gave him my first name in return. After that, he starts saying his full name, which I just think is weird. I brush it off and keep driving, as the road we were on was one of the back roads without a lot of lights, so I'm quite focused. He asks me how I'm feeling, and a question about how I like the city. I discuss my workout in response to that, and I tell him what I like about the city. When I start telling him I like viewing the skyline at this time of night, he quickly agrees and says it's nice how people aren't really around at this time. I agree with him. The conversation tapers at that point, but I do notice that he's turned and looking at me still. He makes a point to say his name again, as if he hadn't previously introduced himself. Now, I pull into the gas station and he kind of deflates. He gets out and roughly says thanks. That was it. Looking back though, there were several red flags. The gym I went to at the time was in a pretty isolated part, but if you were to break down, there was a gas station at the bottom of the hill it was on. You could see it from the gym and it was 24 hours like the gym. Surely, if you needed to wait somewhere else, you'd do so there, and not outside a gym you didn't go to. That brings up another thing. He'd made a point to say what kind of car he was driving. It was an expensive car, and if you're waiting on a tow, you have the option to wait with the car and drive with the tow driver. And also, I really wasn't paying attention at the time, but he directed me toward the road without any lights. There was another way to get to the gas station he wanted to go to, but he directed me elsewhere. Then, the way he kept saying his name, like I should recognize either part of it. Something about that never sat right with me. I can't even remember his name now, but that encounter is seared into my brain. There, when he got out of my car, he didn't even head inside the gas station. He just stood outside. He made no attempt to use a phone or anything. I'm older and not as trusting of people, but man, I know this was a stupid choice on my part but I just wanted to help at the time. It must have been during our Christmas break. An old friend of mine was having a party. There was going to be alcohol and drugs. Of course I was going to be there. This friend lived in a town a few miles away. I was dropped off there with some other folks and expected to be staying there the whole night. But later on, I just decided I really wanted to sleep in my own bed. At this point, it was getting really late in the night. Everyone else was already pretty fucked up. I knew the only way for me to get home would be to walk. I knew at the time it would be a long walk, about three miles. But I was pretty buzzed and pretty motivated to be somewhere comfortable. And I had my Zune on me so I decided to go for it. It was also December in central New York, so there was a pretty steady snowstorm bearing down that night. One important thing you should know is that when I was in high school, I was a big fella. About 5 foot 11 and roughly 330 pounds at the time, so obviously pretty hefty. I also didn't care too much about staying clean shaven, so I had a beard vaguely similar to Fidel Castro and actually dressed like him for Halloween a few years later, so I'm being pretty literal here. I also always wore basketball shorts no matter what the weather was like. Part of that was just being fat and hating jeans. The other part is the fact I've always just seemed to have a really high tolerance for cold weather. It just doesn't bother me that much. So I get about a mile into my walk, 
And at this point, it must be like nearly three in the morning, when this woman, in her early thirties maybe, and driving by herself, pulls up alongside me. She claims to be concerned, which honestly I can understand. I really must have looked kind of crazy, and she insists over and over and over again that I let her give me a ride. I don't want a ride. I'm fine in the cold and I have my music, and I was really kind of enjoying the walk. I tell her I'm okay, but she absolutely refuses to take no for an answer. That's really the first thing that made me uncomfortable in that situation. Even being young at the time, I understood how I looked as a big guy with a big beard and a rough demeanor, walking down a county highway in the middle of the night. I honestly would have looked exactly like the sort of person you are taught to avoid, but she would not leave me alone. The way she kept insisting I got in her car just felt menacing in a way. The problem for me, though, was that even on this 40 mile per hour speed limit stretch, this woman decided that she would just follow me, following just slightly behind me at my walking pace. Every so often, she would pull up next to me and offer again a ride home. At one point, I got fed up with it and decided I'll just take the ride. But as I'm walking towards the car, she tells me that I can't sit in front. I need to go in the back seat. Immediately I determine that's just bizarre. If this woman is so concerned and so willing to pick up a stranger as strange as me in the middle of the night, what makes me sitting in the back seat so essential? I have visions of child safety locks and being inexplicably kidnapped by a woman I outweigh by probably 200 pounds. So I decide I won't be getting in the car after all. She doesn't seem entirely happy with that. Actually, she calls the police. Some cops show up and she tries to convince them that I need a ride home. Cops determine that I'm old enough to make that call on my own and also probably realize what a strange thing that is for a stranger to be demanding. So the cops leave me to it. Nothing much else interesting happens except for the fact that this woman followed me for almost 40 minutes on my walk home. By the time I was close to my house, I was so freaked out by her that I cut through a few yards and actually went to my friend's place, where there was sort of an open door policy, to just wait for another hour or so until I was sure she was gone. There's just a lot about this experience that doesn't make sense to me. Why would a woman, all alone in the middle of the night, decide that she absolutely needed to get me a big crusty boy in her car but only the back seat where was she going at almost three in the morning where she could take a near hour long detour to just follow me home why get the cops to try to literally make me accept her offer none of that seems normal to me and in the moment it was truly terrifying I was 19 at the time and I was hitchhiking for no damn reason other than wanting to do so. No, I was not traveling alone. I was traveling with my friend Randy. Randy and I were somewhere outside of San Francisco thumbing our way to Oregon so I could meet up with my really good childhood friend. This guy pulled up in a big red truck and we put our packs in the back of his truck and climbed in the cab. He asks us where we're going and we just say as far north as you're willing to take us. After a bit, he starts talking to me about how I look like I couldn't be more than 14, how I was really pretty. Naturally, as a female growing up where I did, I was kind of used to creepy comments like this, and never noticed how bad it genuinely was at the time, because it just seemed like normal bullshit. After a slew of compliments and suggestions of leaving Randy, and just going home with him, Randy finally had enough. He told him to just drop us off. He argued with Randy, saying he was just joking and making friendly conversation. But Randy was so insistent on having him drop us off. Randy asked me to grab the stuff out of the bed of the truck, and I hand him my stuff first, naturally. I go to hand him his bag, and the guy just starts driving to take off with me still on the back of his truck. I jump out, scared as fuck. We ended up losing a guitar because I never got to grab it out of the bed of his truck. 
I look back at it now, and while I had a lot of good memories out there hitchhiking, I still get so uncomfortable thinking about this one, because I was just so close to being taken from my own negligence mostly. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one and are doing well. If you don't mind, hit the like button and subscribe. Drop me a comment and let me know what you thought of the stories. Oh, and don't forget to hit the bell icon to turn on notifications. If you fancy checking out the perks of my Patreon or channel memberships, or want to get involved on social media, all my links are down below. I want to give a shout out to my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel, so a huge thanks to Mr. Backwoods, Sarah C., Brenda, Sharon and Ashley, Absinthe Alice, Art and Gaming, Sarah P., Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Kell, Kay, Something Edgy, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Casey, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Lil Smart, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you all on the next one.